Hi everyone, welcome to another psychology catch up session with Carl M. Cymru. Today your presenter will be myself, Miss Bellis, and I teach psychology at the Allen School. Um, this session today we are going to be focusing on some exam technique. All of the sessions will be available on the Carl M. Cymru website um, and so will the resources um, mentioned in this session as well. OK, so what we've looked at already then, we have looked at the dopamine hypothesis and how that explains schizophrenia. We've also looked at structural abnormalities. So that is um, both of our biological explanations. And then last week we looked at the individual differences, explanations of schizophrenia. And today we are hoping to combine all of that really. And I'm going to go through some exam technique for this unit. So still obviously within section A, and although I am, yes, focusing on questions centred around schizophrenia, lots of the mark schemes and elements of the um, questions will also apply to the other behaviours within this unit. So this is obviously an overview of what you need to be able to do in that unit. So study of behaviours, learners must choose to study three from six nominated behaviours. Um, characteristics to know and understand biological individual differences and social psychological explanations to be able to evaluate them, which we're going to look at today. And also we're going to have a little bit of an explore around the methods of modifying the behaviour, which is also known as the treatments. OK, so like I said, we are focusing today's session, like the other sessions that I've done um, on schizophrenia. All right, so one of the, th the first things that you will have learned about schizophrenia are the characteristics. What actually is it? You know, what's it defined as? Um, and although, yes, you could be asked a question, describe the characteristics of schizophrenia, like the one you can see on the screen. Characteristics will come into almost every question. So it's really important that you have quite a clear and in-depth understanding of the characteristics, that you're able to identify them and that you can explain them as well. Um, if it is a describe the characteristics of schizophrenia question, it will either be a 10 or a five mark question. And the bullet points on the screen are just an overview really of um, elements to keep in a, an exam question. So a definition, so what is schizophrenia? We know that it is a form of psychosis where somebody loses touch with reality. Um, you could add in any facts that you know, so it's often misdiagnosed as depression or um, it's more common in males than females. And then going through those symptom categories, you know, we know that they were classified as positive and negative by Kurt Schneider. Um, what does positive mean? Well, we know it's in addition to normal behaviour um, and negative is taking away from normal behaviour. Um, and then some examples, some explanations of the symptoms. So what are they? You know, you've got your positive symptoms, hallucinations and delusions. Um, and then you've got your negative symptoms with abolition and allogia and things like that. Um, talk through those types, you know, at least two. You absolutely don't need to say them all uh, in a question like this. Maybe, you know, two positive ones and two negative ones. But as long as you've got negative and positive ones, um, that would be great. But uh, it would take too much of your time, I think, if you described them all as well as a definition and added in the research from Kurt Schneider as well. All right, so what's on the screen then is a example essay and I'm going to read it to you and then we're going to discuss what sort of mark band it's in. So the question at the top says identify and describe the characteristics of schizophrenia, 10 marks. And this um, candidate has said, Schizophrenia is a type of psychosis. Psychosis is a general term for any mental disorder that involves a loss of contact with reality. Nice, nice start there. We know that they understand what schizophrenia is and they can give us a definition of it. 
Schizophrenia has many symptoms that involve a loss of contact with reality, as well as other symptoms that are key to diagnosing schizophrenia. Symptoms of schizophrenia are categorised to two different categories, positive symptoms and negative symptoms. Positive symptoms are symptoms experienced that are adding on to normal behaviour and negative symptoms are symptoms that are stopping sufferers, sufferers from behaving normally. OK, nice. Maybe we could have added a bit of Kurt Schneider's research into that just to back it up with a bit of evidence. An example of a positive symptom of schizophrenia would be hallucinations. Hallucinations will cause people to perceive things that are not real. This can range from hearing sounds or voices or tactile hallucinations such as formication, which is a sensation that resembles small insects crawling on your skin. However, hallucinations can present themselves in any sensory way. OK, lovely. And we've got a bit of depth there as well. So it's not just hallucinations that this candidate's spoken about. It's also tactile hallucinations and they've gone into detail about what they are. Another positive symptom are delusions. Delusions are beliefs that are unreal. There are two different types, delusions of persecution and of grandiosity. Delusions of persecution involve the idea that a person, group or organisation is going to harm the individual. For example, thinking that they are being watched by the government. Now, the example really adds there, doesn't it? Thinking that you are a celebrity or someone of importance are delusions of grandiosity. Many people will believe there are historical figures, for example, Winston Churchill or the Queen. Again, really nice. They haven't just told us about delusions. They've told us about persecutory delusions and grandiosity delusions. So again, it's showing that level of depth, isn't it? So that's all they've written about positive symptoms, which I definitely think is enough. And then they've moved on to look at negative symptoms. And so it says negative symptoms include elogia and abolition. Elogia refers to the loss of speech. People suffering from schizophrenia may find it difficult to produce a simple sentence or even speak at all for periods of time. This is a negative symptom as it takes away from normal behaviour, which would be considered speaking or producing sentences. OK, lovely, linked back to why it's a negative symptom as well. Abolition is the lack of desire to participate and take part in activities that they would use to find in interesting or enjoy. This is a lack of goal driven behaviour. However, to someone who does not know about a person's schizophrenia, they just may assume this is laziness or maybe even a depressive episode. This is why many symptoms of schizophrenia can be diagnosed as depression before schizophrenia is diagnosed. Now, I personally think that that's a really strong essay. The person writing this clearly understands what schizophrenia is and has a deep and detailed knowledge of the symptoms. Now, yes, they've not really put much evidence in, but I think because of depth and range that they've displayed, it absolutely would be in that top mark bands. OK, so we're thinking nine to ten marks here really really nice okay concise it doesn't waffle and um, they've put plenty of examples in to elevate it that little bit more to maybe definitely hit that um 10 marks i would add kurt schneider's research in okay so let's have a look then at this so this is a, another attempt at the same question so identify and describe the characteristics of schizophrenia again 10 marks it says Characteristics of schizophrenia are the symptoms used for diagnosis divided into positive and negative categories. Negative symptoms are described to be behaviours that are that the individual lacks that are expected of a typical individual. OK, little bit jumbled up, isn't it? Negative symptoms are described to be behaviours that the individual lacks that are expected of a typical individual. It, it, it reads a little bit muddled. It's not very clear. This includes elogia, abolition, anhedonia, flatness of effect and catatonic behaviour. OK, a nice list there showing the examiner that they know all of the negative symptoms. Flatness of effect is when the individual expresses no emotion. They have no inflection in their voice and a blank facial expression. Abolition is when the individual does not react appropriately to stimuli, that a typical individual would consider to be pleasurable. Catatonic behaviour includes abnormal movements such as waxy flexibility, 
where the individual's limbs can be moved, but they maintain in a rigid position. So there's that waxy flexibility is an element of depth, isn't it, in the question? On the other hand, positive symptoms are described to be additional behaviours that are expected of a typical individual. This includes hallucinations, delusions, and disordered thinking. Hallucinations are perceptions that are unreal and can present themselves through any sensory modality, although auditory hallucinations are most common. Okay. Disordered thinking is where speech is described as derailment or night move thinking. This is where speech is illogical and incoherent, and the individual may believe thought insertion has taken place. This is where they believe that their thoughts are not their own and have been inserted by a third party. Now, there's no denying in this question that they are showing range, okay? They've, they've mentioned almost all the characteristics of schizophrenia. So they've absolutely identified, which is what the question's asking of them, isn't it? They've identified the characteristics of schizophrenia. I think they've described some of them really well. They've gone into that little bit more detail. But I think in areas, there's a bit of a lack of, of depth. And I think that's why this would this would probably get sort of oh not the top mark band, maybe the second to top mark band. Mm, seven, seven or eight, possibly, just because it's lacking that little bit of depth. It's, it shows their knowledge and their understanding, but they just haven't gone into that full depth with every characteristic. Now, like I said earlier, you know, you only need to, to say about four characteristics and four characteristics allows you to go into depth. Whereas what this candidate's done is they've said them all, which has meant they've showed range, but it lacks depth. So that's why I think the best advice is to is to say two positive ones, two negative ones, and go into detail about those rather than just skim the top of all of the characteristics. OK, so that was the characteristics of schizophrenia. Next question and an element that I've gone over in these sessions is outline the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia. Ten marks and we've seen this um, essay plan before, neurotransmitters, process of synaptic transmission, dopamine and the early research with L-DOPA and Parkinson's, um, receptor sites in the limbic system and then our mesolimbic and our mesocortical pathways. So this question is asking a lot of you, isn't it, for 10 marks? It's it's complicated, the dopamine hypothesis. I think it's the most difficult area of schizophrenia module. Um, so it's really important that we get this right. OK, so what I have got here, and I hope that this is clear and you're able to read it on the screen, is I have scanned in um, an essay that one of my students has written um, of this dopamine hypothesis. Now, um, it's got a few elements. I think there's a, one on the next page as well. Yep, but I marked this 10 out of 10 and I said that it was perfect. OK, so I'm going to read this to you and I'm hoping that you can see where they've clearly understood and explained this dopamine hypothesis really well. So. Um, it says one biological explanation of schizophrenia is the dopamine hypothesis. Previously, a link was identified between Parkinson's disease, a neurological condition which can cause tremors, and schizophrenia because Parkinson's patients were given L-DOPA, a drug that increases dopamine. Their Parkinson's symptoms were alleviated. However, they began to experience symptoms of schizophrenia. Hence, a link was found. Therefore, it was suggested that too much dopamine causes schizophrenia. This was the initial hypothesis. This was supported by Griffith et al. inducing psychosis in non-schizophrenic volunteers by giving them a dopamine increasing drug. Participants displayed an onset of paranoid delusions and hallucinations. OK, nice bit of evidence in there. However, this was deemed as too simple because giving individuals with schizophrenia who experienced mainly negative symptoms, dopamine blocking drugs did not help. It was found that there were D1 to D5 dopamine receptors found mainly in the limbic system, which controls emotions, information processing 
and spatial awareness. The D2 receptor was found to be particularly affected by antipsychotics, which Seaman and Lee carried out in their research. It was found that there is a lot of dopamine activity in the limbic system and in two main pathways. The mesolimbic pathway is responsible for positive symptoms of schizophrenia. This pathway carries dopamine from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens. Too much dopamine in this pathway from neurons firing too quickly or too often causes overstimulation and leads to positive symptoms such as hallucinations. Some antipsychotic Antipsychotics reduce dopamine activity in this pathway by blocking the dopamine receptors and therefore reducing positive symptoms. The mesocortical pathway is responsible for negative symptoms. It transports dopamine from the ventral tegmental area to the frontal cortex. Davis et al. found that a hyperfunction of dopamine is found in the D1 receptors in the frontal cortex of individuals with schizophrenia who experience negative symptoms. Now, I know that there is an element up here as well um, where they've spoken about um, synaptic transmission and I think they realised afterwards, OK, uh, that they needed to add that in. So it says in um, synaptic transmission, the active particles travel down the presynaptic neuron, diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to the receptor sites of the postsynaptic neuron. So they absolutely, you know, if we go back here, they absolutely have included all elements of that SA plan. They've got about their neurotransmitters. They've got about synaptic transmission. They've got lots of bits of research. They've got Griffith et al, Seaman and Lee. Um, they've put the bit about Parkinson's disease in. Um, so really, really in-depth and you know thoroughly detailed knowledge of the dopamine hypothesis. Um, they've spoken about those receptor sites. They told me what the limbic system does. Um, and then they've got, you know, knowledge around the mesolimbic and the mesocortical pathway as well. And they've also put some research in there too. So I'm hoping you can see from that just how good that essay is. It's concise, it's to the point, um, and they've got all the elements in there with some great terminology as well. OK, and it's correct, isn't it? So a really, really, really Great essay, great example of how to answer that question. OK, this question then outline the structural abnormalities explanation of schizophrenia. So this is our next biological one. Um, and again, you have already seen this, so it's making sure that you, you know, what do structural abnormalities suggest? What are the four ventricles? Where are they? You know, one and two is lateral ventricles. You've got your third ventricle by your thalamus and your fourth ventricle between your pons and your medulla oblongata. Evidence, so you've got Nancy Anderson, um, evidence of CT and MRI scans. Um, cortical atrophy, that whole idea of loss of neurons, which looks as though the sulci is widened in your brain. And that means that your cognitive function is impaired and some evidence around that. So that is Daniel Weinberger. And then what normal asymmetry and how reversed cortical asymmetry is. OK, so people with schizophrenia's left hemisphere is slightly smaller than their right, which means that it could explain symptoms such as allogia. However, ours, normal functioning people, um, their left hemisphere is bigger than their right. OK, so they have, we have, um, cerebral asymmetry and they have reverse cerebral asymmetry. OK, so that is how I would answer that question. I don't have an example of that one, um, but again, it's making sure that you have got evidence in your answer. OK, terminology, evidence, detail. Those three things are the main thing you need to ask yourself once you've read back through an essay. Have I got terminology? Have I got evidence? Have I gone into detail? OK, an AO3 question now um, would be to evaluate. Evaluate two biological explanations of schizophrenia. 15 mark question. OK, so lots of marks up for grabs here. I'm going to sneeze, I think. Yeah. Bless me. Um, the brackets here say that the knowledge you should have around the two biological explanations 
you should be able to apply to a novel situation. Now, all a novel situation means is um, a case study. So you might have a bit of information about somebody that has schizophrenia and you have to pull out elements of, of their sort of diagnosis and embed it within your answer. But I'll show you an example. So evaluation question, lots and lots of marks up for grabs here. We need to make sure that we get it right. So we know it's two biological explanations. So we need to say, right, our biological explanations are dopamine hypothesis, structural abnormality. We need to think about evidence. So what evidence are we going to bring in? What are the issues that we want to discuss? And an easy way to do it is to create a table like this. So you can clearly see the points and the links that you're going to make. Um, a little look at the mark scheme for this then. Um, AO2, evidence used is well chosen and applied effectively to develop the argument. And there is depth and range, which I know I keep going on about, but it's super, super important. Um, the details are accurate and there is an effective use of terminology. OK, so those bits in bold, evidence, detail, terminology, which I keep going on about, they are what are going to get you the marks in this. For AO3, a thorough evaluation made of the explanations for the behaviour. Structure is logical throughout and an appropriate conclusion is reached based on evidence presented. And again, effective use of terminology. Credit could be given for strengths and weaknesses, comparison of two explanations, comparison of other explanations, validity, research evidence, strengths and weaknesses of the research evidence, ethical implication. So it's actually quite broad what you could talk about in this question. Um, but again, difficult because there's so much that you could say um, and so much to get in in you know, a short amount of time. OK, so I have got here an example of a. Evaluation of the biological explanation of schizophrenia, OK, it's quite long, as you can see, there's very. Uh, quite a lot of elements to it. It got 12 out of 15 marks. Um, and I think that's mainly because it wasn't um, there wasn't a very developed conclusion on the end of that. But I will explain my reasoning for those marks um, once I have gone through this with you. So I'm hoping that this is readable um, and not a bit fuzzy, but if you're struggling to read it, I'm going to read it out anyway. So it says the first biological explanation for schizophrenia is the dopamine hypothesis, which explains the neurotransmitter dopamine is passed along neurons at the synaptic cleft and the postsynaptic neuron from the presynaptic neuron. OK, that is all. Oh, no, it's not. Research has found limbic system is a main focus. Um, D1 to D5 receptors that they have two pathways, mesolimbic, mesocortical, and they both explain the positive and negative symptoms of skits. So that is all those two little paragraphs. That's all they've done to introduce and show the examiner. Yeah, OK, before I evaluate it, I'm going to tell you what I know about it first. OK. Um, this hypothesis does make sense. However, it has negatives as well. Um, one thing this e explanation doesn't take into consideration is that dopamine imbalances may be caused by genes and then they've got some research. Their point is dopamine imbalances may be caused by genes. They're backing it up with some evidence. Irving Gottman completed a study on cousins, grandchildren, half siblings, siblings, identical twins and non-identical twins. He found a genetic similarity increased so did the likelihood of both people getting schizophrenia. OK, nice bit of depth there. OK, so they've told me exactly what their participants were. The schizophrenia working group also found 108 genetic loci associated with schizophrenia. This means much more research must be done to complete this hypothesis. OK. Lovely, because they've got two bits of evidence. They've gone into detail. They've given me a point. And then they've explained it again. OK, so when we think of point evidence explain, they've really followed that well, haven't they? 
The only way to measure dopamine levels is by measuring um, its metabolite, which what's get, gets broken down to in a cerebral spinal fluid. Dopamine's metabolite is called HVA, and it can only be measured by a lumbar puncture, which can be extremely comfortable for the patient involved. The data collected may be unreliable because metabolite levels are so widely affected by drugs and diet. The levels vary so much for each person. This means the data collected may not be useful and cannot be used beyond this point. OK, and then I've written as a little bit of feedback. They could develop this bit a little bit more. OK, we have to tread cautiously. So maybe we come up with a different idea. OK, they've put the evidence in, but I don't think they've given me that full explanation there. The role of serotonin is another point. The dopamine hypothesis doesn't mention old antipsychotic drugs, only blocked the D2 receptor site. This didn't have an effect on all patients suffering with schizophrenia. However, fewer atypical antipsychotic drugs also blocked the D1 receptor and serotonin, and this stopped the symptoms for the patients continuing from this. The theory may not be completely um, complete, sorry, as there are still factors needed to consider. OK, little bit fuzzy, but they've got their detail in there. They've told me about the receptor sites. They've told me what that means for schizophrenia. So a good, really, really good um, evaluation there. OK, second biological explanation is structural abs. There are three components to do with structural abnormalities. Firstly, in large ventricles, ventricles are vital for carrying and transporting cerebral spinal fluid. There are three ventricles left and right. And look, they, you know, they've gone on here to really explain their knowledge. OK. And they've put a little fact in there, a bit of statistic. Good. Showing the examiner, you know what uh, structural abnormalities are. The second abnormality uh, is cerebral. Uh, Yes, yeah, cerebral atrophy, um, which affects cognitive functioning and makes the brain smaller. The third one is reverse cerebral asymmetry. And again, they've gone on to explain that. Is that slightly too much for an evaluation question? Yeah, it is, because there aren't really necessarily marks to get here. It's just quite nice to show the examiner a brief explanation of what it is before you evaluate. So I think maybe this really big long section here is a little bit of a waste of time. But then here we go on to our evaluation. So many psychologists wonder if the explanation um, is replicable. Flashman and Green, OK, nice bit of research, confirmed. Confirmed the link between atrophy and schizophrenia. Robert McCauley assumed, confirmed the link between ventricles and schizophrenia. However, he also said factors such as age and sex, etc., affect structural abnormalities. To conclude, the results may, may need to see sub, subtle differences as they are overly replicable now. OK, again, a little bit muddled. However, there is a bit of evidence in there. It's not the, the most detailed, is it, point? And they definitely could have expanded on that slightly more. Many psychologists think structural abnormalities is a cause of having skits. However, there was a study done that found as antipsychotic drugs increased, the brain density decreased, suggesting many of the drugs for schizophrenia are actually the cause of brain abnormalities. There are other conditions. We have structural abnormalities, for example, bipolar and schizoaffective disorder also have enlarged ventricles. These share many symptoms of skits, so maybe we need to look at fewer, at some subtypes, differences um, when evaluating and diagnose, diagnosing them. To conclude, there needs to be more research into the aspects of this explanation. Now, as you can see, the evaluation of the dopamine hypothesis is much stronger than the evaluation of structural abnormalities. OK, there is evidence in there. There is detail. There is a little bit of depth. There is a little bit of range. Um, the conclusion, 
lets this essay down. OK, um, here's kind of a bit of a conclusion, but a one sentence conclusion isn't appropriate, is it really, for an A2 exam? So develop your conclusion here. You could add in about diathesis stress, the idea that our biological structures are prerequisites, but they're triggered by our environment. OK, so an example there of how, you know, detailed and thorough the answer could be, but also it needs to be consistent. OK, structure is logical. Um, thorough evaluation made, terminology, details are accurate um, and there's, you know, it's applied effectively. OK, are they effectively evaluating here or are they just stating facts? OK, so I'm hopefully that's helpful that you've seen that example. OK, another little question then here is to do with methods of modifying schizophrenia. Now, this question, I think when you initially read it, it kind of um, freaks everybody out because it's so long and wordy. But it says schizophrenia has significant economic consequences. The costs impact on many different parts of society, especially on individuals with schizophrenia and their families. Overall, schizophrenia is estimated to cost society £11 billion per year. With reference to this fact, apply your knowledge and understanding to discuss the ethical and social implications of two different methods of modifying schizophrenia. Now, it's the evaluation of the methods of modifying, isn't it? But they're asking you to really, really link it to ethical and social implications. Now, when you have evaluated methods of modifying, you will have evaluated ethical, social and effectiveness of the method. Um, but we need to think about um, economics, don't we, in the fact that it costs society and you must link back to that in your answer. So, <coughs> excuse me. They're asking us about ethical and social implications. <coughs> We've got antipsychotics and CBT. So again, draw yourself a little table, right? What do we know? What are our ethical implications of antipsychotics? What are our social implications of antipsychotics? And the same for CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's once you've got the table, you're, you've kind of mapped out your answer, haven't you? You've got everything that you need. So I have an example one here. I'm just going to double check my next slide. Yeah. OK, so ethical implications. We've got that they work, OK, um, and a bit of research. OK, the research, what I've done is I've put it in purple and I've underlined it. Um, clozapine is better than bufenazine. Newer drugs have less side effects, but clozapine can affect immunity. Old drugs still needed as better for some patients. With ethical implications, you can always talk about the side effects. OK, as soon as you, you're met, somebody mentions a drug, every drug will have a side effect. Can with consent? OK, can you can somebody with schizophrenia give you it fully informed consent on the drug that they are taking? OK, if we know that schizophrenia is a lot of touch with what is real, they might not be able to. OK, so that's really nice to bring into an evaluation. And then you've got a piece of research. Are drugs just chemical straitjackets? Do they actually get to the root cause of schizophrenia? Are they actually helping them or are they fueling them with drugs and leaving them alone so they can just get on with things and have schizophrenia forever? OK, so we're losing that social control. And obviously because the question is asking you about social, this is a really nice point to bring in. The social implications, care in the community, OK, does having people with schizophrenia on drugs allow them to be more independent and more socially free? Yes, it does. Um, it costs the economy a lot less than hospital care. So putting them in an institution or an asylum is really, really expensive. And obviously your question is looking at the economic side of things. So that's quite a nice point. Drugs are cost effective. OK, they're much cheaper. But like I've said, what about revolving door syndrome? Are we getting to that root cause? And then you've got risk of violence. You know, drugs are still needed as patients can be a danger um, to themselves. You know, there's the whole idea of ending their own life and non-compliance. OK, how do you ethically 
give somebody a drug if they don't comply? It's a difficult one. And then for CBT, um, less invasive, but there's no side effects. But what about patient blame? Are they going to take the blame for getting schizophrenia? Is it going to really make them think about, you know, what might happen in their lives that have caused it? Does it add to the burden? OK, does it bring up past events? Then you've got a bit of research by Cupers. They ask the patients, patients have given some really positive feedback, OK, which is great. Prejudice by psychiatrists in not giving CBT is unethical for the patient. So they might think, oh, do you know what? The easiest thing to do is administer a drug here. Um, and that really impacts people, doesn't it? You know, Kirshen said that only 48% of people are actually offered CBT. And then lots of research to say it's effective. Again, Cupers and Tarrier, they show less negative feelings towards the voices that they have. They start to understand their own condition. Um, when they have CBT and maybe that is great in terms of ethics because it empowers them, doesn't it? It gives them control over their own condition. And then CBT in terms of social implications, postcode lottery, you know, it might be better for some people in some places. Some people might be, um, you know, offered CBT and it might be really effective. In some places it might not. It completely depends on where you live um, and the resources in that area. You know, the variation is 67% to 14%. Um, cost effective, OK, it prevents revolving door syndromes. It gets to that root cause. But the NHS works on short term budgets and CBT, we know, is super, super expensive and time consuming. So there are lots of elements within this um, essay plan that would allow you to link your question back to this, OK, that holds £7 billion a year. The cost impact on many different parts of society, especially on individuals with schizophrenia and their family. So you can absolutely use those points and bring them into that question. What you need to be able to do is really make the examiner aware that you're, you know, explicitly adding to, you know, linking that question in. So even if you take small quotes from it and you use the word in that it's got, OK, that will show a really clear link. And then at the bottom here, there is a conclusion. So it says need culture to change in psychiatry and CBT to be more valued. OK, so they both have changes that they need to happen. Always consider asking the patients, OK, Morrison's research exercise choice what do they think what do they want you know they're human beings at the end of the day and they have a right to choose always research newer drugs with less side effects you know what else is there what's out there are there any with less side effects should we administer them you know through an injection rather than a tablet if there's a lack of compliance is there any medication that they could take once and they don't have to take it again you know until three weeks time so there's a lot to talk about here, isn't there? But I just hope that that is quite a nice way of collectively looking at the evidence that you've got. And there's there's a hell of a lot there and I don't think you would need to use it all. But I'm hoping that that would really um, help you ans to answer a question like this. And I, I definitely would say that creating a little table like that and planning your answer would really, really benefit you. One whilst you're revising but also there's nothing stopping you you know making a very very quick and brief table at the top of the exam paper just so that you could quickly get your points down it doesn't have to be a table but it you know it could be a couple of bullet points but planning an exam question before you write it well there's a you know there's a, a real sort of link between people that do better on exam papers that have a plan the people that don't because they understand what they need to do. OK, I know that was a lot, um, but I hope that going through some of these answers has been really, really helpful for you all. And um, just want to say a massive good luck for your exam. I hope that these sessions have been useful to you. Um, and like I said, any resources, this PowerPoint, um, they will all be on the Colin Cumley uh, drop down box of the ESCOL website. Thank you all, and I will just.